everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Okay, so today we are still moving through this one, the body, Yuasa Yasuo. Uh, so in the last video, we looked at some the two other Japanese philosophers that he talks about in here, uh, Watsuji Tetsuro and Nishida Kitaro. Uh, and we also looked at his own, Yuasa's own um, perspective on his own theory, I guess you could call it, his own philosophy. Um, on mind body and the relationship between the two <clears throat> um, today we're going to look at today is my the first of of two videos in which I'll kind of analyze critique the um, the book and th in this video I'm going to look at the things that I really liked about the book and the next video I'll, I'll take up um, the areas where I kind of disagreed. I have a real kind of love-hate relationship with Buddhism, to be honest. Um, I, I had a Buddhist phase for a while. Um, and then, because there is a lot to recommend in Buddhism. There's a lot of good stuff in Buddhism, for sure. Um, but ultimately, the, the things that I disagree with are really deal breakers in the end so it's i'm always kind of wavering when i read buddhist philosophy and, and buddhist books it, you know so there are things that i read in there that's like yes 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 and then it'll be boom no no so um it's it's kind of that's the relationship i have so there's there's good stuff to be to be picked up from this book anyway and i'm going to run through that today and we'll start by looking at uh, getting beyond the intellectual thinking self. So this is kind of, this is a theme that runs through through the whole book. Um, getting beyond the, the mind, kagito, that reflective, analyzing intellect. Um, which is... is uh, very valid right it's very useful it's very um and it, it's and that actually it, it's this is at the core of phenomenology and, and existentialism we we don't live um from that cogito from descartes cogito we live we live kind of prior to that that cogito that reflective mind comes along afterwards and analyzes what you've lived um, but when you're living it, when you're doing it, when you're engaged, you're not thinking about it analytically, intellectually. Um, I remember talking about this so much with um, with Milo Ponti and, and also Bergson. Uh, there's a lot of this in Bergson, um, the, 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 the way he distinguishes between the intellect and intuition. So that, that comes through there as well. So lots of this, this idea... Um, it's it's prevalent in all of those philosophers that, that I've looked at so much in these videos before. Um, so that's cool. That's a really, I think, useful and um, important way to think about this. A couple of ways that he, um, he stresses how we get beyond the intellect is, um, well, there are a couple of ways he, he talks about it. One is inspiration. So inspiration as a as a, um, a method or, or a way in which we kind of bypass that overly rational, critical, analytical mind. And here's a quote from the book. An excellent poem is composed not when the author has a definite thematic plan and clear vision of his composition, feeling he can expedite it immediately, but rather when a thematic place and vision for Waka poetry comes to him out of the blue without his initiating it. Don't strive for an excellent poem. With much training, it will be composed naturally. So that's cool, right? Inspiration, We, in a way, if you try too hard, you're, you're an obstacle to yourself. You're an obstacle to, um, to, 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 in a way, tapping into this, into this process. Um, but I want to, you can kind of go off the rails with this and, and start imagining that you're literally tapping into or sensing or picking up the creative energy of the universe or, you know, you can go off the rails if, 
as, as far as you like with this this idea but we don't have to we don't have to go there i don't think um and and i think it's better not to obviously that, that's my take on it anyway but um but inspiration it strikes without this um without the mind so we don't want to overanalyze but it, it's not something which comes to us from some mystical source that, that we are unaware of and that's what he says right it's hidden it's, it's there in the quote with much training it will be composed naturally so inspiration doesn't just come from nowhere you can't just meditate for 20 years in a cave and come out and and write the perfect poem right you have to be trained it's something that comes to you um, only after you've put in the groundwork. So it's not, it's not, you're not like, again, I think it's a mistake to think of this as tapping into something out there. You are, and it's not tapping into anything anywhere, even inside either. What you're doing is, uh, what inspiration is, it's, it's the, the fruition of the groundwork that you've laid in yourself, the training that you've put into an art. Um, and so I think that that kind of dismisses this, this notion of inspiration kind of coming to us from a source unknown. Uh, it, it's something that we can, we have to cultivate. We don't cultivate into uh, inspiration directly, but we, we cultivate the skills the, through the training. And then once we, we've achieved a certain level of competence, of of ability then then we're open to inspiration we have the kind of the, the cognitive the physical if it's if it's a physical art um, tools necessary we've, we've laid the groundwork for inspiration to, to strike so that's really cool anyway getting beyond the intellectual self through inspiration another way that he talks about this is is just experience experience itself the importance of experience Here's the quote, no matter how much one is exposed to sacred teachings and books, attainment is not his unless he knows for himself what is cold to be cold, what is hot to be hot. So that's cool. Again, the uh, it's more than just academic. It's more than just reading a lot and, um, you know, taking in information. You have to actually live it. You have to experience it. You have to to feel it. Um, and again, this is all through all of existentialism. All existentialists talk about this. It's all through phenomenology. Um, uh, what have I got here? Let me just read this. So Bergson, the self, he talks about the self as being... Um, almost almost literally made up of the ideas and the beliefs that you have so those ideas he says that that you that you've taken on that you've appropriated that you have um, fully assimilated those become a part of you a, a part of your the core of who you are and so when other ideas come along you're not you're not so much analyzing those ideas, looking to see if they they, they make sense or they're logical. Rather, you're, you're looking to see if they match with who you are, as as uh, this this kind of composition of all of those ideas that you've taken on before, all of those beliefs that you've picked up and assimilated. So um, so that's cool too. I mean, it's there in Bergson. It, it's there through all of all of. Uh, existentialists. Kierkegaard wrote in pseudonyms. A lot of his his philosophy was written um, under pseudonyms, and the reason is to, or well, the reason was to um, engage the reader, to get the reader to to engage with him, not as Kierkegaard the philosopher or Kierkegaard the Christian, but as this other author, this other person who. May not have he may not share Kierkegaard's views, but it lets you kind of immerse yourself in this this other person's perspective. Sartre wrote 
novels. Right? Nausea was a, was a good example of this. Again, letting us experience something. He wrote lots of plays as well. So very um, a more engaged approach, trying to draw the reader in, draw the, the, the audience into feeling something, experiencing something along with experiencing the ideas, the, the philosophy that he has, not just um, kind of reading it and, and abstractly trying to understand it through concepts. Heidegger, again, poetry was important for him. Same reason. It's, it's all about experience. So yeah, so you have to, it's not enough to just read stuff, to take in information. You have to experience it. You have to live it. You have to assimilate it. I like that, that word here. So that's cool. And the other way that he talks about, Yuasa talks about getting beyond the kugito, the thinking mind, is through habit. And I, I quite liked this. Um, I haven't read this exact kind of phrasing before, the way the way he, he, put, he, he put it, but it was a nice way to think about it. Initially, when you do something, when you, when you um, try and, and perform an action, try and do something you haven't done before, the body is resistant. It's cumbersome. <clears throat> it's like an obstacle. You, you know, if if it's maybe trying to play an instrument, or actually that's a good example. Maybe trying to get your your hands or your fingers coordinated to to do whatever play whatever instrument it is properly. Uh, it's like you, you're battling with your body. Your your mind knows what you want to do, but your body's this. It's just not playing ball. Um, and that's because the subject is this kogito, it's this reflecting mind trying to impose its will on the body, um, trying to control the body, direct the body like it's an instrument, like it's a thing that you are, uh, <clears throat> that you're controlling. Uh, and that, that's the way it has to be at, at, at first, but uh, eventually you overcome that and, and the body kind of becomes or you 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 instill in the body the habits that that let the body perform that task smoothly here's the quote to harmonize the mind and body through training is to eliminate this ambiguity in practice it amounts to subjectivizing the body making it the lived subject this is a practical not a conceptual understanding so yeah there you go the just getting your body Training, training your body to perform this task, to do this, um, as opposed to, to to the mind kind of imposing its will on the body, which is a very di uh, it's a separate way of looking at it. dichotomous. What I'm looking for, it's a it's kind of a sets up a dichotomy between the the mind and the body when you when you can can kind of fuse those together then you have this, this um, you get the results that you're looking for, the body and the mind working as one harmonious whole. Now, obviously, Milo Pondi talks a lot about this as well, becoming habituated to something. Uh, he says, to habituate oneself to a hat, an automobile or a cane, is to take up residence in them. So that's going beyond the body even, but to things that we use, things that we um, appropriate external to us. We're not in them in the same way that we're in the body, but, but, but they, take, they become for us like extensions of our bodies, not, not tools that we're using. The, the person with the cane doesn't, um, they, don't, they don't treat the cane like an instrument, like, an, uh, like an, something that they're directing. It becomes as natural to them as as moving their hands. It just becomes an extension of their their arm. Uh, and also knowing how to type, that's not the same as knowing the location of each letter on the keyboard. So that same idea again, when you're typing, you're not thinking about where you're putting your fingers, where the letters are. You just you've uh, through through that training through through. Uh, prior effort you know where they are your body knows where they are you don't have to um, direct your body to, to the to the appropriate keys um, <clears throat> so th that's nice right 
habit overcoming this this dichotomy between the body and the mind letting the the the, the two work together nice um the, the next part i want to look at the next positive thing i took away from the book is the focus on the body and look at that now so what was really good about you are here and this is it's in the title the body um but uh, he, he puts more emphasis on the body and that is something that has been neglected um traditionally in the west i think so including the body in our account of reality in our account of of the lived human experience this again is it's prevalent in in all of the philosophers that we've looked at before Milo ponti who sees the body as as or who sees the view from the body as kind of a privileged perception. Bergson as well, it's important in him, he sees the body as a privileged image. That's the term that he uses. He's talking about um, everything as, as an image, including the body, and it, but it, the, the, the body is different from other images and that it's privileged. It's a, it's a center of action for Bergson, which is exactly what um, Yuasa is talking about here. The other thing that was good here, and I liked in Yuasa, is he talks about the interconnectedness of all things. Uh, and this, I think, he doesn't use this this expression, but it seems to me like this is the Buddhist notion of dependent arising, which is basically that, that idea that everything is connected, everything is um, inextricably bound up with every other thing. So nothing is nothing is kind of an island. There are no islands of um, things. Instead, everything is is kind of bound up in this whole. And uh, in Nishida's place of nothingness, we talked about that last in the last video. The body doesn't exist as an individual object, kind of an isolated, separate thing. Uh, the distinction there between one's body and others' bodies disappears. So we're seeing this kind of a holistic picture emerge here. That will become very um, supernatural, metaphysical, in, in a way I think that, that I can't, um, that, that I'm not so comfortable with. But... As a, as a metaphysical picture of reality, I think it's it's spot on. And it's exactly what Bergson talks about as, as well. He talks about the, uh, the universe as a whole enduring, whereas the individual inanimate objects in it that we carve out from that whole, they don't endure uh, because they're parts. They're, they're parts that have kind of been cleaved off from the whole. But when we take into account the whole itself, then we get um, what he calls an individual. So what's something that endures? Uh, and that's kind of the same idea here. This is a seeing everything, seeing the world and all of the objects in it as continuous. The, the uh, in some sense, the distinctions we make between objects and between ourselves, my body and other people's other bodies, um, are artificial. There is a there is a, a a metaphysical truth there. I think where we are connected. Like I say, we have to be careful with that because it's very easy to go off the rails into that and start thinking, well, then maybe we can where telepathy or um, telekinesis or something, you know. The, the, the possibilities for going off the rails are endless. But I think at, at a deep metaphysical level, it's certainly true. It doesn't mean that, that you know, we can, we can bridge that gap in any way, in any real way. But, uh, but I think as, as a metaphysical picture of reality, it's a nice one. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to, to bring your attention to here in the book is you asked us focus on the emotions. So he brings this up, and it's it's good that he does because again, this is another thing that has been kind of um, bypassed a little bit in philosophy. 
But he asks, what is the role of emotion in human lives? And he, he talks about Sartre, actually, uh, who, who did discuss emotion. But for Sartre, principally, emotion was, it was a, a magical response that we have to, to a situation which is too much for us to handle, which we can't deal with. Then emotion takes over and, and, um, and that reaction, that emotional reaction is kind of what happens when we give up dealing with the world. The world is too much for us to deal with, to cope with. So emo we, we let this irrational emotion um, carry us away. But this is kind of, and, and that, that's not necessarily wrong, but it's a focus on emotions as, as a negative thing and, and as kind of a, um, almost a disorder, you know, where emotions no longer, not, not dealing with emotions as we normally see them, but kind of dealing with an extreme case of emotion where where the normal way of, of interacting and, and engaging with the world is broken down. Uh, and Yuasa says, feels that there is a more a positive ro role for emotions in philosophy. And I think he's right. And he suggests that emotions make us aware of our desires. And, and in doing so, they provide a direction for behavior. I really like that. That sounds like a really nice picture of, of what's going on when we're having emotions, when we're experiencing emotions. Um, and so it, it's kind of like, it's almost like getting to know ourselves. And, and I talked about this um, yesterday when I was filming another, making another Bergson video. He talks about um, pleasure and pain as sensations, which which indicate to us what our body is already inclining towards, the reaction that our body is, has involuntarily, involuntarily um, already started carrying out. So we receive a stimulus and, and our body automatically starts acting, but emotion or sensation, pleasure and pain, that that is kind of an indication for us bringing to uh, our awareness, a level of awareness, if you like, or consciousness even, where um, what our body is doing, what, where our body is, is inclined to go. And from there, we can decide to go with it or we can decide to, to change tack and do something different. But <clears throat> the point is that, that that initial emotion, that feeling, that sensation, is an indicator to us. It indicates what our body automatically wants to do. So, again, privileging the body. The body is something, um, something special. Something that that's it's 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 not leading, but it's it's uh, central in our reactions and in, in, in our responses and in, in our in our decisions for how we're going to respond. That in a way that I think hasn't been recognized enough in philosophy, which is why I like phenomenology so much, because it really gets into that kind of thing. It looks at, it includes the body in its, in its, um, in its worldview, in the same way that Yuasa does here. So that was cool. So that's um, emotions. And that, that's, that's it. That, those are the things that I really wanted to um, draw your attention to, things that I thought were... were um, particularly useful from the book. Uh, well, let's have a quick look at a summary anyway, we'll run through them. So first we talked about going beyond the intellect, moving beyond that rational analytical mind. We looked at inspiration as a way of getting around, bypassing that overly analytical mind. We also looked at experience, so it's not enough to just read and, and take in information, you also have to live it, you have to experience it in order to really know it. Good words there, assimilate or appropriate the ideas that you, that you um, have learned, learned about. And the last um, topic we looked at in this section was habit. So habit is a way which lets 
kind of it shifts the focus from the mind controlling the body to the body or to the to the mind inhabiting the body in a way to the the body kind of controlling or or handling itself without without the direction of the mind and again that, that's the only way to uh, do some things well you see this in in sports things happen in sports just just too fast for you to for the mind to deal with it's not enough time for the mind to take in the situation make it decide on what it wants to do and then send the instruction to the body the body has to react itself and and that comes about through through training through um, instilling these the skills that, that are required in the body directly uh, then we looked at the body itself, and uh, the positive thing here was that there's more emphasis placed on the body. So you ask to take some more, um, focuses more on the body, includes the body in his philosophical picture. Uh, and I also like the uh, the notion here of things being interconnected, how um, my body and other bodies fundamentally at a at a at a metaphysical level. Um, there is no distinction. There's there's continuity rather than discrete pockets of bodies. So that was nice to see. Um, and finally, we looked at emotions. And the role of emotions, you ask us, is, is to make us aware of our desires. So that was a nice way of thinking about this. They inform us of... of um, Desires that arise, again, in the body. So the body is central here. And that they then act as a direction for our behavior. We can then decide what we want to do from there. Cool. So those are the, the things I took away from um, from the book, the things that I thought were really, really uh, useful. Um, yeah, the uh, all of this centers around the body too, right? So all of this is... is talking about that it's in the title i guess but but bringing the mind and the body together so that there's there's no instead of this dualistic framework where you've got a separate mind here and a body here and the mind kind of controlling or operating uh, the body like it's an instrument we're trying to kind of bridge that gap um, and that, that's a gap Again, that, that I think we've seen in, in all of the other philosophers and phenomenology. Phenomenology is, is really big on this idea of, of the human subject being embodied. So that, that's a, a crucial term. It's been overlooked, however, in most of philosophy, but, but uh, that, that's one of the reasons why I really like phenomenology. And it's good. It's great to see it in, in Buddhism as well. So that's cool. Next video, we'll look at uh, some of the the things I thought were not so useful from the book. Um, but that's next time. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you then.